Hello there ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I will be your Gaming Monk for the evening. A franchise like Pokemon needs no introduction. Whether you're someone who argues about the generations, Gen 1ers suck, focus on the animated version, or trot out the tired hot takes relating it to slavery for the umpteenth time. Naturally, a game that has that level of effect on people would inspire them to do their own stories and takes on the formula. While a fair chunk of this is in the realm of the fan-made video games that Nintendo tries to snuff out like an invasive species, this also covers the attempts at role-playing games. Today we'll be looking at arguably the best of those with Pokemon Tabletop United, hereafter referred to as PTU for the sake of brevity. PTU is a kind of sister successor to the long-abandoned Pokemon Tabletop Adventures, and is considered by many to be the premier Pokemon RPG. Does it live up to the hype? Well, let's find out. For a fan-made work, it's really impressive how it presents itself. At a whopping 508 pages, the writing and format is nothing short of professional, with little in the way of distracting color balance or jumpy text. However, I still have to dock points for the lack of an index. But, like always, this is more principle than malice. By its very nature as a tabletop RPG, PTU has the opportunity to do things that the video games can't, in this case, the trainer is as important as the Pokémons themselves. We'll be taking advantage of that with our rookie trainer, Okwa, conceptually a lead-from-the-front kind of trainer. The first step is background, which determines the basic skills the trainer has. Unless modified, skills will start as untrained, one step above pathetic. Regardless, each background has one skill at adept, one at novice, and three at pathetic. The lattermost skills cannot be raised during creation. Now, Okwa's background is going to be listed as Wanderer with an adept rating in athletics, a novice rating in combat, and a pathetic in intimidate, stealth, and technology education. Second is edges, which represent training in broad and specific fields. A starting trainer can pick from four edges that they qualify for, as the majority of the available edges are rooted in skills. Okwa's starting edges are there for athletic initiative, basic martial arts, basic skill command, and train the reserves. Third is features the most defining aspect of a trainer's capabilities. Many of these are tied into PTU's class system. A starting trainer gains four features and one free training feature. Okwa's training feature is agility training, the commander class, along with precision orders, and the martial artist class with the technician ability. Mobilize and martial training round this out, and thus allow him to learn the double kick and arm thrust moves. Fourth is combat stats, which are effectively the same six stats from the games. Hit points, attack, Defense, Special Attack, Special Defense, and Speed. HP always starts at 10, and the remaining stats start at 5, with 10 additional points to distribute, with no more than 5 in a single stat. In Okwa's case, it'll be 3 in Speed and HP, 1 in Attack and Defense, and 2 in Special Attack. Because of the plus speed tag gained from the Martial Artist class, he has an additional point to speed. This allotment also means he has 1 point in all three evasion types, Physical, Special, and Speed. Fifth is Derived Stats, which are rooted in the aforementioned stats and the trainer's level. Action Points, which power a trainer's features, always starts at 5. Trainer HP is based on 10 plus twice the trainer's level and 3 times the HP stat, making it 51 in this case. Power is the raw physical strength, which starts at 4, with an additional 1 for having an adept rank in athletics. High Jump and Long Jump demonstrates the character's jumping capacity, which starts at 0 and 1 respectively. Overland movement speed is how fast they can move over flat land, and this is based on the acrobatics and athletic skills, in this case resulting in a total of 6. Swimming speed is equal to half of this. Finally, Throwing Range dictates how far a trainer can throw, based on athletics, in this case, 8. Sixth is Starting Pokemon. For the purposes of this, we'll be going with one level 5 pick. Taking the theme he has into account, we'll be going with Main Foe as our starter. There are mechanics to further build Pokemon, but we'll get into that later. Finally, Starting Equipment, which is a Pokedex and 5,000 pen to spend on supplies. We'll be spending that on 6 Basic Balls, 3 Potions, an Antidote, a Paralyzed Heal, and a pair of Running Shoes. Character creation is pretty concise though I do think it's a little tight on skill picks, since your future picks build off of them. I bring this up because of how it handles classes outright encourages multi-classing. The skill picks from the background should be a wide setup to give a pool of paths to focus on instead of specializing. 
Also, I could see the skilled names throwing some people off because of the ingrained idea that untrained is the lowest rank. Those pieces aside though, I think character creation holds a lot of potential, but I would recommend newcomers use one of the archetypes as a base first. Build variety does not apply to just trainers, but Pokemon as well. To that end, even starters don't have their stats set in stone. Since we went with Mind Fu as our starter, we'll use that as our example here. However, for the purpose of this, we'll be bumping up his level to 10 instead of 5. We add a number of stat points equal to 10 plus their level. These 20 points must still apply to the base relations rule, where the order of stats from lowest to highest must still be maintained. After distributing the points, the remaining spread is HP 10, Attack 12, Defense 9, Special Attack 7, Special Defense 8, and Speed 11. Third is Ability, a passive or active effect inherent to the Pokemon in question. At the start, you pick one of the two basic abilities. In this case, we'll go with Inner Focus. Finally, Moves, the battle techniques available from leveling and training. In this case, at level 10, Mindfu has Pound, Meditate, and Detect. Additionally, while Mindfu does have three tutor points to spend on TMs or Edges, we won't use that here. Overall, I think the layout allows for a fair bit of flexibility without overdoing it. It can seem a bit crunchy, but it's clear the variety is meant to be in a synchronized team as in the video game version. The only tricky part I could see is the base relations rule. I get it's to prevent dumping points on a set of abilities, but this could bottleneck variety to a certain extent. Still, at the very least the resource management isn't going to be as intensive here, so I'd say it's a net positive. PTU uses a D6 based system, which is typically used as a sum instead of a number of successes. Unlike the traditions and its contemporaries, there's no attribute skill dichotomy because there are no attributes. At best, attributes in the traditional sense are categories for skills. There isn't really an extra effort mechanic, unfortunately, with action points being the closest equivalent, but not quite. Combat-wise, there's a solid economy of actions, with the trainer and the Pokemon getting a set of actions appropriate to them. The combat system makes a distinguish here between league fights and full contact fights. What might throw things off is that it uses a d20 system instead of the d6 system that skills do. It's not as divorced as other games, but I could see this being a potential issue. It does have the same DNA from the d20 system, but I appreciate the fact that it doesn't entirely fall into the same traps as the d20 system does, especially with map use having optional rules for abstraction. Additionally, the fact that stat increases or decreases are unified with the combat stages helps minimize the issue that happens with static values that become less useful at higher levels. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention the system regarding Pokemon contests. The first thing to note about contests is that they have their own set of five stats, each correlating to a combat stat. Cool from attack, tough from defense, beauty from special attack, smart from special defense, and cute from speed. Unlike combat stats, these are D6 based akin to skills, and are granted for every 10 points in a combat stat. These are used more like a resource, but we'll get to that in a moment. Contests are divided into two stages, Introduction and Performance. Before that, the GM may determine what type of contest it is, which will determine the contest stat that's focused on. Introduction can be seen as the trainer introducing the performance in a Master of Ceremonies matter. In this stage, the trainer rules one of the following, Charm, Command, Guile, Intimidate, or Intuition. Each die that results in a 3 or higher grants the Pokemon an additional stat die based on the skill used. Obviously, Charm for Cute, Command for Cool, Guile for Smart, Intimidate for Tough, and Intuition for Beauty. The performance stage is the true bulk of the contest. This can be thought of as the encounter in the contest, and takes place over a number of rounds equal to the amount of contestants. At the start, each contestant is assigned a letter, based on the total stat die in the introduction stage. During each round, the contestant performs a move they have and uses its contest type and effect instead of its normal rules. If the move matches the contest type, they can roll an additional die, or lose one die if it's the opposing type. This is where the contest stat comes into play, as there are resources used to add d6 to rolls, with a maximum of 3 to 1 move. When a move is performed, the die results will determine how many appeal points, which are the view of the contestant from the judges, are gained. Each result of 1 gains no appeal, 2 to 5 gains 1, and a 6 gains 2. The X factor in these rolls is the center of attention, which one contestant will be in every round. In that case, a 1 causes you to gain a fumble, 2 gains 0 appeal, a 3 gains 1, a 4 and a 5 gain 2, and a 6 gain 3. It should be noted that there are some moves that grant voltage. 
which grant an additional 1d6 to their next move at, for each point of it. At the end of each round, whoever gained the most appeal is considered the winner of the contest. While the contest system seems daunting at first, it doesn't come across as much in actual play since it's not too far divorced from the core mechanics. It just uses them differently. The only thing I could see being an issue is the position mechanic, since it's presented in a way that might confuse at first glance. To that end, I consider the contest rules a more advanced affair, and I would not recommend first-timers use the rules for non-standard contests. It would be very easy for this game to simply aim for reflecting the experience of the video games. Instead, it outs beyond that and tries to encompass the entirety of the franchise as best it can, owing to its name. If there's anything that is this game's greatest strength, it's its flexibility. It's not particularly interested in doing the expected, but instead wishes to present a toolset for the GM and players to use their way, even using whole settings if appropriate. What demonstrates this mindset further are the two setting supplements, Game of Thraws and Duporigon Dream of Marip, which cover using the core mechanics adapted to fantasy and science fiction, respectively. In a weird way, this game reminds me of the Mastercraft duology, as it does not approach the material with much in the way of assumptions on how it's supposed to be played, many of the mechanics being able to be tweaked, and customization is their battle cry. And if I'm comparing this game to my favorite reskin of D&D, I think that alone speaks volumes. If it isn't obvious, Pokemon Tabletop United gets a rating of strongly recommended. In my eyes, this is the definitive Pokemon RPG and is even willing to dive into areas that the source material doesn't or can't. The fact that all the PDFs of the game are for free only makes it even better of a sell for your table. That said, I'd have a harder time recommending it to people who are fans of the series with a more metagame persuasion, i.e. the type that would argue about tiers and balancing in the games. It could be tricky to unlearn the habits ingrained from the video games, since you don't have to be the same kind of trainer those games portray. That's a minor nitpick and I still feel confident in recommending the game to anyone, regardless of being a fan of the show or the games. Except the Gen 1ers. You can never please them.